Lesson 1. Energy, starting with 1.1, mechanical energy. Physics is the study of energy. But energy is quite an abstract concept. It's hard to define. So instead of defining it right off the bat, I'm going to explain it using an analogy. Energy is a lot like money. Since money is something you pretty much understand, let's look at some of the properties of money that can be compared. Money can be stored. If you have a savings account, you can put a certain amount of money in the savings account and it will be stored up for later use there. However, you can also have money available to use if you have a checking account or if you carry cash. Unlike a lot of things we talk about in physics, money has no direction. You can't really talk about having $5 to the left. No, you just have $5 or you don't. And so negatives and positives in money refer to loss and gain. Negative money is a loss. Positive money refers to a gain of money, not directions. Money can be converted to different currencies. You can take Canadian dollars and convert them to euros, for example. And perhaps the most common property of money is that money can be used to buy stuff. In fact, if somebody asks you to define what is money, it's kind of a hard thing to define. But probably the best definition that you could come up with is money is used to buy stuff, or it's the ability to buy stuff. It's not a complete definition of money, but it's a reasonably good one. We're going to take all these properties of money and look at them in terms of energy. Energy has a lot of the same properties. Energy can be stored. In this case, it's stored in the form of potential energy. Mon energy is also available to be used or visible when it's in kinetic form. Energy has no direction. You don't have energy to the left or energy to the right. Energy is a scalar, so it doesn't matter which direction it's in. Energy can be converted from one form to another. And energy can be used to do what we call work. Work is a word in physics that just refers to the transfer of force from one object to another. So energy can be used to transfer force. The best definition that is given for energy has to do with this ability to do work. It's not a very complete definition of energy in that it doesn't say all that energy is, but it's the best one we have because energy can be quite an abstract concept. There are many different forms of energy. You may have studied these forms of energy in other courses. In fact, all the different branches of physics are really different studies of the different types of energy. Light energy, sound energy, electrical energy, chemical, magnetic, mechanical, heat, or elastic. Physics 20, and most introductory physics courses, is mainly the study of mechanical energy. If you go on and take physics 30, you'll study light energy, electrical energy, and magnetic. Mechanical energy is the energy of moving objects. So mechanical energy has a lot to do with Newton's laws, which you've already been studying, as well as speed, velocity, and acceleration. All forms of energy can be described in terms of two main categories. 
These are not forms of energy themselves, they're actually just category, categories to describe the forms of energy. The first category is kinetic energy. Kinetic energy has to do with the motion of an object. It's the energy of movement. Kinetic energy is the energy due to the movement of an object. And it has to do directly with the speed of the object. In fact, the formula for kinetic energy has speed in it. The second category of energy is potential energy. This is energy that is, sits and stored in an object, even if it's not moving, available to be converted into kinetic energy later. Potential energy is the stored energy of an object due to the object's position or location. For example, an object that's located at a very high height has the potential to fall under the force of gravity and gain kinetic energy. So height is considered to be a type of location for potential energy. All forms of energy are scalar quantities. What this means is that there is no direction associated with energy ever, and even better, you can just directly add energy to energy without having to worry about uh, vector addition or angles. Energy is a lot easier to do calculations with. Energy is measured with the unit joules. The symbol for energy, no matter what type you're working with, is an E, and the unit is always the joule no matter what form of energy you're working with. Now let's look specifically at mechanical energy. Mechanical energy is equal to the kinetic energy of an object plus the potential energy of the object. Kinetic energy is given by the formula EK equals one-half mv squared, where EK is the kinetic energy, and that's a little subscript K next to the E indicating kinetic. This is measured in joules. M is the mass of the object that has kinetic energy measured in kilograms, and V is the speed of the object in meters per second. Potential energy has the formula EP equals MGH, where EP is potential energy, E subscript P, the P indicating potential, measured in joules. M is the mass measured in kilograms. G is 9.81 meters per second squared, the acceleration due to gravity on Earth. And H is the height of the object. How high it is up to changes how much potential it has. And this is given in meters. It's important to note that this formula for potential energy only applies when we're talking about gravitational potential energy. The potential energy due to the height of an object in a gravitational field. There are other forms of potential energy with other formulas, but we're not going to look at those here. Let's look at an example. A 0 0.50 kilogram ball is falling at 10 meters per second when it is 30 meters from the ground. What is the ball's mechanical energy? We start by calculating the two forms of energy it has. Kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared which is 1 half 0 0.50 times its speed, 10 meters per second squared. This gives us a kinetic energy of 25 joules. The potential energy of the ball is mgh. This is 0 0.50 kilograms times 9.81 meters per second squared times the 30 meters of height that it has. This is 147.15 joules of potential energy. The total mechanical energy is EK plus EP. So it's the 25 joules plus 147.15 joules 
is 172.15 joules, and in correct significant digits, this is 1.7 times 10 to the 2 joules. Another example, this time solving for something inside the mechanical energy formula. A roller coaster car carries 2,000 kilograms of mass. How fast is it going when it is 25 meters from the ground? If it has 9.5 times 10 to the 6 joules of mechanical energy. mechanical energy is the potent is 9.5 times 10 to the 6 joules and it's the potential energy plus the kinetic energy of the roller coaster car the potential energy is mgh which is 2000 times 9.81 times 25 meters this is a potential energy of 490500 joules. So the mechanical energy is 490500 joules plus kinetic energy, which means the kinetic energy can be solved for by subtracting potential from mechanical, and it's 9009500 joules. Once you have the kinetic energy, you can rearrange the kinetic energy formula to find the speed. Ek is 1 half mv squared. This means that v is 2 ek divided by mass square root. So the speed is 2 times 9009500 joules divided by 2000 kilograms square rooted which is 95 meters per second. Before we finish, we need to make a quick note about the joule. The joule is a metric unit in that you can put prefixes on it like kilojoules and centijoules and decijoules, but the joule is actually just a constructed unit. It's made from the base units meters, seconds, and kilograms. Let's look at the kinetic and potential energy formulas to see how they could be constructed from these units. Mass is in kilograms and speed is meters per second and speed is squared. This is a kilogram meter per second meter squared per second squared. Potential energy is mgh. This is kilograms times meters per second squared times meters, which is the kilogram meters squared per second squared. All these base units combine to form the actual unit of the joule. One joule is actually a kilogram meters squared per second squared, but this is too difficult to write, so we usually just write it as a joule. 1.2 Conservation of Mechanical Energy we start with the definition of the word system. In physics, a system refers to a collection of connected parts forming a whole. For example, the Earth, which is made up of many different parts, is considered to be a system. An isolated system is a really important concept in physics. In physics, an isolated system is a system that does not exchange matter or energy with its surroundings. The concept of an isolated system is a little bit idealistic. There's really no such thing as an isolated system in real life. Isolated means that nothing can enter or exit 
And we know that that's actually impossible. Even the Earth isn't an isolated system because sunlight and the, the energy from the sun enters the Earth. An isolated system must also be frictionless, and it's impossible in the real world to actually have a frictionless system. For that reason, isolated systems are kind of ideal, but they're easier to do calculations for, so we use them as a concept. Isolated systems are critical for understanding the law of conservation of energy. This law only applies in an isolated system. The law of conservation of energy says that in an isolated system, the total amount of energy remains the same. Conservation means staying the same. So conservation of energy means the total amount of energy stays the same. This doesn't mean that energy can't change forms within the system, but it does mean the total amount when you add all the energies and all types together must be the same. Kinetic energy can turn to potential, and potential energy can turn to kinetic. But the law of conservation of energy says that the total mechanical energy, which is Em, which is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy, must remain the same. Here's an example that shows the law of conservation of energy in action. As the ball rolls down the track, notice that the yellow bar, the total mechanical energy, remains the same. The potential slowly converts into kinetic as the ball goes down the track, and as it travels back up again, the kinetic decreases and the potential increases again. Kinetic and potential exchange and transfer into each other, but mechanical energy remains the same. So if we consider the same track again, at the very top where the ball is placed, we're going to call this the maximum height. When the ball is just placed at the maximum height, the initial kinetic energy is zero. Let's set the mechanical energy to be 10 joules, just for the purpose of the example. Since the kinetic energy is zero at this maximum point, that means the potential energy must be 10, because 10 plus zero equals 10. Halfway down, half of the potential energy has been converted into kinetic energy. The mechanical energy, according to the law of conservation of energy, must remain the same. It's 10 joules still. The kinetic energy is now 5 joules because the ball is sped up and the potential energy has decreased accordingly. 5 plus 5 still makes 10. When the ball gets to the very bottom at the ground, the height is 0 meters. The mechanical energy is still 10 joules. But since the height is zero, the potential energy must be zero joules, which means the kinetic energy must be the total 10 joules, because 10 plus zero makes 10. Partway back up again, we have a mix of kinetic and potential energy. But the mechanical energy must still equal 10 joules, so the potential energy and the kinetic energy must add to equal 10. At this point, let's say that the potential energy is 3 joules. This means that the kinetic energy would have to be 7 joules, because 7 plus 3 equals 10. The law of conservation of energy says that kinetic and potential can change, but the total mechanical energy has to be the same at all points in an isolated system. Here's an example that uses numbers and allows you to calculate the speed at a different point. Here's another roller coaster track. We're going to call point A having a height of 1.5 meters, and point B, HB, has a height of 0 0.5 meters. A 2.5 kilogram cart 
is placed at point A on the track shown below. How fast is it going at point B? Here's how we do this calculation. We know that the mechanical energy at point B must equal the mechanical energy at point A because of the law of conservation of energy. That means the potential energy at A plus the kinetic energy at A must equal the potential energy at B plus the kinetic energy at B. We know at point A because the cart was just placed on it, it had no speed, therefore the kinetic energy at point A was zero. Rearranging, we can find the kinetic energy at point B equals the potential energy at A minus the potential energy at B. So the kinetic energy at B is the potential energy, which is mgh, which is 2.5 times 9.81 times 1.5 for point A, minus mgh for B, which is 2.5 times 9.81 times 0 0.5 for point B. This gives us a kinetic energy at point B equal to 24.525 joules. We can use this kinetic energy to find the speed at point B because the kinetic energy formula is EK equals 1 half mv squared. This can be rearranged for V to be the square root of 2 EK divided by m. V is square root 2 times 24.525. Work. In previous videos, the mills, we developed an analogy kilograms, for energy using which gives energy 4.4 meters per second. Now, it's important to realize in these calculations that mass doesn't actually matter. And this is true for most conservation of energy calculations. I'll show you why. If you have two points, A and B, the mechanical energy at point A will be equal to the mechanical energy at point B as long as we're working with an isolated system. So EPA plus EKA equals EPB plus EKB. Writing out the formulas in full, we have MGHA plus one half MVA squared equals MGHB plus one half mvb squared. Notice that all of these equations, these formulas have m in them. If we divide each one by m, we see that m cancels out. So you don't actually need m to do the calculation properly. Here's an example. The nice thing about this example is I'm going to do an inclined plane problem without having to do all the vector addition that we did when we looked at forces. Here's an inclined plane where an object is sliding down an incline from point A to point B. The height at point A is 0 0.75 meters and the height at point B is 0 meters. We don't even know, need to know the angle of the incline because energy is not a vector, it's a scalar, so direction doesn't matter. We just want to know how fast is the block sliding at point B, and we can use conservation of energy to solve this. We know the mechanical energy at point A equals the mechanical energy at point B. This means MGHA plus 1 half MVA squared equals MGHB plus 1 half MVB squared. And mass cancels out across the whole formula because it's in each term. This becomes 9.81 times 0 0.75 for point A plus 1 half 5 squared equals 9.81 times 0, which is the height at point B, times one half, plus 1 half VB squared. This gives us 
joules equals one half VB squared. VB equals 6.3 meters per second.
1.4 power and efficiency.